Welcome to the Political Trench of Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormick and myself delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. In each episode, we dissect the decisions and explore the dynamic landscapes of local governance. Today, we bring you the letter Y, which stands for youth. Later in the episode, we will be chatting with former Mayor Frederick Bedell. Ian, feels like forever. How's the start of March going for yourself? I, I disagree. Yeah, it's not forever, but I, right here in this part of the country, March certainly came in like a bit of a lion. Hopefully it goes out like a lamb. Somebody was saying to me the other day, you know, feels like we had our March back in November and we're getting our November now. So whatever. Anyway, let's, this is, uh, look, it's a good topic. Nice to talk about youth for, for, uh, for why. Um, we have a few big stories and the one I want to start off with is a judge has reinstated a councillor from a southern Manitoba rural municipality after the council she sits on tried to remove her from missing meetings while she was at work. In his decision dated February 9th, Court of King's Bench Justice Chris Martin blasted the Reeve and council for the RM of Thompson and the local urban district of Miami in the Pambia Valley, southwest of Winnipeg, for disqualifying Councillor Donna Cox after she missed three consecutive meetings held at 9.30 a.m. because she was working and her employer would not give her unpaid time off to attend those meetings. Quote, generally communications, collaboration, and compromise are hallmarks of good governance. Here, the municipality failed miserably, end quote, Judge Martin wrote in his decision. At a special meeting last April, the RM of Thompson Reeve, Brian Callum, told Cox she was disqualified from her position as a result of missing meetings. Counselors adopted a motion of about a month later, to formally remove her from her position. She had been barred from fulfilling her duties as counsellor since then, despite a petition with about 60 resident signatures requesting that council hold its meetings during the evenings at least once a month, the decision says. The municipality then took the matter to court after the province said that that was the only way Cox could be legally disqualified under the Municipality Act. Now, Ian, I had a hard time trying to figure out which way I wanted to start off my line of questions here on the story, but I want to start with the councillor's dilemma. Prior to being elected to council, she should have known about the time of the council meetings and had tried to potentially clear them with her work prior to being elected. Shouldn't she have? Sure. Well, historically, if the RM had held its meetings at a particular time on a particular day of the week and a particular week of the month, she would have a pretty good understanding about what was going to happen. But there's nothing in the act that says that that that, can, that has to continue. The members of council can choose when it is that they want to hold their meetings or special meetings or committees of the whole or whatever the case might be. So she may have gone into this knowing what the existing dates or timing of the meetings was. But it's not something that was not able to be changed had there been enough goodwill amongst all of council to make a change like that. Meetings, meeting times can change. And we, you and I both know that the life of a councillor is not a part time job. It is not a sit in a council meeting one time a month and that's it. It is a full time job with part time pay, as we always say on the show. Is it realistic to understand, and we're going to get to the judge's remarks here in a few seconds, and I'm going to start asking questions about the flip side of this story, but is it realistic to ask potentially counselors to meet at 930 in the morning when people have full-time jobs that they have to adhere to, or is is the council in the right to say, well, we're meeting at 930 because we have a long day and we don't want to go until 1030 at night rather than go till three o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah. But different councils in the country, different councils in each province and territory meet at different times and on different days. Uh, the desire to have a broad cross section of the community represented on council often means that we need to adapt this council meeting date days or times to fit uh, the broad uh, spectrum that we're looking for. There's nothing that said every council meeting has to start at 9.30 a.m. or everyone has to start at 5 p.m. They can move around if the one can be an afternoon meeting, one can be an evening meeting. There's a principle at play about meeting people where they are and the philosophy behind that might just be looking at. We're looking for 
a, a, a different group of different demographics of people to be represented on council, not just those people who can make a 9.30 a.m. meeting work. There are various considerations. This one, of course, being employment. There, child care, schools, other jobs, anything like that could have an impact on why we might want to choose a, a, a different meeting time or a rotating meeting time within reason. People have to know that when council is meeting too. You made a, a comment too about, uh, about employment. And almost all local government officials in this country are part-time, are considered to be part-time in terms of remuneration but fewer of them are part-time in terms of the actual hours they put in. And so a lot of them, for example, even if they aren't, uh, even if they are part-time, they can't hold down the afternoon shift at Walmart because the meeting schedule is just so irregular. And then the other pieces that are part of the job, the attending other types of meetings or events, um, cutting ribbons, uh, representing the municipality, uh, conferences, all of those things happen on an irregular schedule. So holding down the regular job is tough. There are people who do things where they work for themselves, or maybe they're a realtor or a consultant or uh, work out of their homes uh, and or have spouses or partners who can fill in, makes it work. But you, it's very difficult to hold down a regular shift in a, quote, regular job as a counselor in this country. So on the flip side of this story is the, the judge's remarks. Judge Martin said, quote, Generally, communication, collaboration, and compromise are hallmarks of good governance. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you know, this it's funny. We, we use the term good governance quite a lot. And it tends to, while there are some core tenets about it, but effectively discharging your duties or following whatever your municipal act is, there are other bits and pieces that can be bolted onto that, some of which the judge made a, a reference to. But to me, th this seems like, and, and, and meetings, whether they are council meetings or committee meetings and attending those and contributing to those, if not, it's it's in most, if not all acts, that that is one of the core things that an elected representative has to do because it's it's about conversation based on the government of proximity. And if you're not part of the conversation as an elected representative, then your your voice is not being heard and you're not adding to the best decisions that can be made, which is also part of what good governance is. Should councils compromise to work together? Because this is what the hallmark of this whole lawsuit was about and what the judge's uh, verdict was or decision, I should say, was um, should more and more councillors be working together instead of against each other? We're going to be talking about a story out in Northwest Territories, which is kind of in the same vein of what we're talking about here. But this has actually gotten to the point where it's in the court system. Right. Is this kind of a negative spot on uh, the arm of Thompson's uh, uh, persona when it comes to potentially working together for the betterment of the community. Sure. And it's the long-term betterment too. It's not just how are we going to work for the next month or year or even this, this term, this, sorry, this term. And what's going on here is the, there's, there doesn't seem to be a ton of goodwill, which is probably based in something historic. We don't really know what that happens to be. But it seems like a desire on behalf of the other elected officials, or at least a majority of them, to create an untenable situation for this particular council member so she couldn't attend these meetings. And most of the time, the missing of meetings is it usually has to be an unexcused absence. Because if you're sick or if you're on a round the world cruise, you're going to miss some meetings and but those are excused absences. What seems to have happened here is council chose not to say those absences because the council had to work are excusable. And so that's why they started to add up to the point where they became a disqualification offense. So for sure, this is about goodwill. It is about the desire to work together. Councillors don't get to choose their teammates in, in the most of the country anyway, but you become the first team for your municipality. You're expected to work collaboratively. You don't have to be friends. You don't have to go for drinks before or after the council meeting. But you do have to act in the best interests of the whole community over the long term. Now, after the decision was finalized, the Reeve of the community wrote to CBC that the council, quote, acted in accordance with the provisions of the Municipal Act, as well as our duties and obligations to our ratepayers when a councillor has failed to attend meetings and missed three consecutive meetings, end quote. The RM 
for just clarification's sake, is considering its appeals option on the verdict that on the decision that Judge Martin rendered. Ian, could this be more than what it's just about on the surface? <laughs> it's never about what it's about, Chris. We've been through this many times. This well, we bring we always come back to it though. <laughs> we do. And it, so there's there are issues of role clarity here. There are issues of understanding what the job is in general and the teamwork and all of all of that sort of thing. There's the strategy here, the, sorry, the strategic leadership of the community rather than the operational leadership of the community. So there are all of these things that come to play. And for sure, I shouldn't say for sure because I'm not a lawyer, but it appears to me that the, the council is following the municipal act in that council gets to set dates, times of meetings. The majority of council does. But we should not be ignoring the rights of the minority of council, even though it's uh, it, it's a uh, more people put up their hands to have morning meetings than did for afternoon meetings. So, yeah, they're following the law. No, they're not showing any goodwill. So the hamlet of Enterprise Northwest Territories is in political turmoil after several of its hamlet councillors walked away some before they were even sworn in as councillors, seemingly unwilling to work with their new mayor. In an election in February, former Deputy Mayor Sandra McMasters won the mayoral seat, ousting Michael St. Amour. McMaster won with 29 votes to St. Amour's 25 votes. Also elected as councillors were Barbara Hart, Malcolm McPhail, Michael Zach Kimball, and Charles Sutherland. However, McPhail, Kimball, and Sutherland decided not to take the oath of office, resigning their seats before they were sworn in. Another sitting councillor, Jim Divs, whose seat was not up for grabs in last week's election, last month's election, also resigned from council. That leaves McMaster, Hart, and Daryl Sopel on council. Quote, so right now we have currently one mayor and two councillors, and so what's the process is now is figuring out what the next steps are, because the requirement from the minister is to have one mayor and six councillors, end quote, said the CAO of the Hamlet, SAO of the Hamlet, I apologize. Now, according to McPhail, it is the simple lack of confidence in McMaster's mayoral duties. Quote, it's a very stressful time for an awful lot of people, and I don't, I don't think she can handle it, he told CBC. Ian, people have spoken and they have elected a new mayor in Enterprise and have elected a new council. Some have returned as councillors, but new members have been elected. Should councillors, as we talked about in the story in Manitoba, should councillors and all elected officials put aside any differences and work together for the common good? Yep. Next question. No, <laughs> this is another one of those cases where the community has chosen a group of people who have to work together, not necessarily that they have to be friends. Now, Enterprise, I have a lot of empathy for what's going on in Enterprise because there's fewer than 100 people there as of the 2021 census, and it's not been an easy place to be recently. They were heavily affected by last year's wildfires in the Northwest Territories, and before that, I believe they had a significant, I think it was literally a tire fire a few years prior, prior to that as part of their dump. So there's a lot of pressure that's being put on elected officials in, in Enterprise. The councillors didn't sign up to manage disasters. They job eventually became far more than they thought it was going to be, likely far more internal conflict and conflict between the community and well, there aren't a whole lot of neighboring communities, but maybe the government of Northwest Territories as well. The last election, the new mayor, who was a sitting council in the previous term, got four more votes than the incumbent. It's first past the post, right? So there was a change in the mayor's seat and the incumbent didn't, wasn't returned. So the, these people were brought forward to work together. The, conf, the, the comment from at least one person about we chose to resign before we were sworn in because of a, quote, lack of confidence is an interesting one because who the, the public choose who they had confidence in. So the members of council are expected to represent the public. Public had confidence in this new mayor. So maybe the new council should have given her a bit of an opportunity to to create that confidence in her as well. To me, some of this sounds a little bit like a, a politician who says they want to spend more time with their families, which may mean that. It may mean something completely different. It can be a cover for something else. Getting back to the initial statement, it's never about what it's about. 
Speaking of a uh, uh, difficult climate, we're going to turn our sights to Quebec now. The mayor of Gatineau, Quebec, abruptly resigned her seat last month, citing a difficult climate for municipal politicians in the province. Quote, I really question the price paid to accomplish this demanding work in a context. Let's say it, that is often hostile, end quote, said the mayor emotionally to reporters. The mayor then said she has been witnessing to witness to personal attacks that go beyond normal political criticism, including death threats from members of the public. She said she's decided to quit effective immediately to preserve her health and her integrity. Quote, being mayor is the most wonderful job I have had and the greatest honor that has been given to me. But it also has been the most difficult job I have had, end quote. She also cited unspecified upcoming decisions with which she does not want to be associated with. The mayor called on the provincial government to reflect on the plight of municipal politicians, citing other cases in which politicians have quit or taken leave of absences. Two former mayors, one the mayor of Chappas, Quebec, has resigned uh, last year after the wildfires in her community, and the mayor of Sherbrooke has taken a temporary leave from her job starting last October, setting a risk of exhaustion. Ian, as the days of municipal politics being a one-day-a-job month, as we talked about earlier, where they sat around a table to officially come to a close, essentially, has the job of the has the job of local governments, municipal politicians, now become one similar to a provincial politician or a federal politician? Maybe uh, the uh, local people used to operate under the media radar. But unless there was a, a small newspaper in town and a reporter going to council meetings, there was very little coverage of what's going on in local government situations. Now, of course, that's changed with, with what people are calling citizen journalists. We've seen people who are upset about things and showing up to council meetings, broadcasting them, which also means that I can tune into the got no council meeting anytime I want, probably, rather than just having to do it uh, while it's live. So. It is becoming a really even more difficult job. And there's a thread that has run through all of our stories today, through Thompson, through Enterprise, and now into this one, about sometimes the thankless task of what's going on. And to me, there, the, the, what's happening that the mayor is showing and other members of council. And we've also seen stories about council members dying as well. And the stress that's being piled onto them certainly can't have helped in some of those situations. So we can't do, we as a collective, can't really do anything in the short term about some of these natural crises that are occurring, uh, fires and too much water, too little water, but we can do something about unacceptable behavior. Uh, during my research process for my new book about abuse, I'm finding more people talking about more serious types of abuse that are almost becoming acceptable. I don't think they are, but they're being seen as a, acceptable the minister, there's a quote from the minister, the relevant minister here, talking about an epidemic of departures across the country. And I think that's particularly true. It's, it's true of elected officials as people choose not to run for office or choose not to re-up and try running again for office or as young people find other callings that they don't want to participate in this. And I think as a country uh, and as a series of local governments, we're all worse off because of it. So yeah, I think there's an epidemic here. I think it's bad. I think it's getting worse. And a lot of it is because of the way we treat each other. Get out of partisan politics. Don't bring party politics into municipal politics. There's my rant. And stop using social media. But we'll be right back with our interview with the former mayor, Frederick Bedell. Welcome to Why is for Youth on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Frederick Beadle, the former mayor of the township of Narm and Hyam, Ontario. Frederick is a trailblazer in the realm of municipal governance. Elected at the tender age of 19 as a councillor, then elected as deputy mayor by his council colleagues, and then subsequently sworn in as mayor of his community in early 2022 after the former mayor resigned. 
Frederick's journey stands as a beacon of inspiration for aspiring young leaders across the nation. As this show is about getting more youth involved in politics, I want to start by asking you, what motivated you at such a young age to enter the political realm at the municipal level? Yeah, so um, growing up, I mean, politics was always kind of something that I had an interest in. I had uh, pretty intuitive parents that would uh, talk to me at the dinner table about, you know, this party stands for this and who's the leader of that party and difference between federal and municipal and provincial at a, at a very young age. Um, and then what really got me into it is I did a program uh, in Ottawa in grade 11, which is called Forum for Young Canadians. And uh, that program had used to have, I, you know, after COVID, it's changed quite a bit, but uh, used to have three weeks of uh, about 100, over 100 students each week, stay in a hotel in Ottawa, uh, you know, kind of live the days of an MP throughout uh, about a week, uh, go to the Hill for a question period, all that kind of stuff. So I, I came back from that pretty inspired um, wanting to volunteer with uh, certain members of parliament or um, members of provincial parliament. And so from there, I really started getting to think, okay, well, what, what's the next step here? So then I, I did my um, political science degree at Carleton. And from there, yeah, I, I started volunteering on some campaigns. I started uh, volunteering in Ottawa with my MP. And it really, I, I got so interested into it. And then um and then the flyer came out, uh, you know, the town that I represented is only about three, 400 people. So uh, the flyer came out and it said calls for uh, calls for candidacy is, is coming in May. And I thought hmm, this might be an opportunity to get my foot in the door and, and live it uh, at, a, at a very small level, but at least live it. Um, you know, I, I always have aspirations at some point to, to go uh, bigger than that, but um, for now, yeah, I, I had my four years under my belt there. So um, it, it's just kind of steamrolled more and more ever since I was a young guy. So, so I'll, I'll take over a bit from there. You had made a reference to about having helped out or volunteered or at least been interested in other orders of government as well. And by the way, a generation ago, I went to Forum for Young Canadians as well in my uh, must have been grade 11 or grade 12, I suppose, too. But why municipal rather than jumping straight into provincial or federal uh, elected office? Yeah, I think I think municipal is really accessible for anyone who wants to put their name in. Right. It's pretty simple. You go down to the town office, you put your 50 or 100 bucks in or whatever it is, and you get your name on the ballot. I think to me, I saw that as an accessible, accessible avenue to get my foot in the door. There was no party affiliation. It was just grassroots ideas. And from there, I kind of realized, okay, municipal governments are responsible for way more than people think. And, and it's really the stuff that affects you every day. I mean, you know, I think when I think about it, it's, you know, your municipal politics or your municipal policies, you know, your garbage doesn't get picked up or your streets don't get plowed. You're going to notice that more than what the feds or the province is doing. So to me, that really reason why I got into politics was, you know, someday I just, just want to change a person's life or make it better. You know, it, it's when someone just says, I have this problem and I need you to fix it. That's to me, what was the attraction of that? Because when I picked up the phone, it was a very small municipality. I mean, most, uh, most residents had my phone number, personal phone number. So I'd pick up the phone and they say, well, this is going on. What can you do about it? So I think that was that was mostly my motivation to to get myself into municipal politics. And then at that point, I was able to to meet, you know, people from larger cities and and meet with uh, provincial uh, members of parliament as well. So why don't you think more youth get involved municipally? Because we are seeing and I'm speaking as someone who talks to municipal leaders from across Canada and Ian works with administrations across Canada, more and more young people not going into the local arena, the political arena, and more wanting to focus their attentions provincially, territorial, or even federally. What What is the reason behind that, do you think, as someone who made that leap in 2018 to run municipally? Yeah, I mean, municipal politics is, is not, it's, there's no fame and glory really associated <laughs> to it at the end of the day. 
I mean, I don't know why there's there's a push for younger people to go that way. Uh, to me, it was just it was such a great entrance door to get in there and and uh, to put my name forward and say, this is who I am and this is who I stand for. And I'm trying to help my community. But at the end of the day, I think it, it really just comes down to a lack of interest in general. Like I said before, so many people don't even know, know what different levels of government do and don't do. Um, so I think really at, at, at the head of it is there's a problem of just young people getting involved in politics in general. Um, you know, in, in high school in Ontario, we have a civics and careers class. And, and I think the whole civic system needs to be blown up and redrawn from the start uh, to, to get more people interested. The it, it, There's just not enough people to get younger people interested. And, you know, the, there's there's resources and there's avenues for that. But, you know, every party's got a youth wing and every party's got uh under 25 or under 30 membership, that kind of stuff. But it really, I had some great mentors at the, the federal and the provincial level. And I also had a great mentor at the municipal level. And that really mattered because that person had been on council for 20 years and, and really showed me what it's like and what, what types of things get discussed at meetings. And if you don't have that person or that contact at local government, or you don't have parents bringing you to council meetings, you're not going to be, you're not going to be interested in it. You're not even going to know you're not, it's, I don't know. How can municipalities make that, that olive branch extension to the next generation? Because we're, the average council is not 35 and younger. The average municipal councillor is about 45 and older, and that's pushing it saying 45 and older. What can municipalities, particularly the councils of today, do to extend an olive branch to the younger generation, to your generation, to the generations who are in grade 10 civics classes right now to say, come join us, come see what you uh, municipal council does? Because like you said at the beginning of the interview, our impact is greater than what you think it is. Yeah, so there, there's a few things. Um a lot of bigger municipalities will have a mayoral advisor advisory board of sorts or a youth council. Um, youth, youth councils are great. Uh, it's a great way to have a group of like-minded individuals that are about, you know, it really depends on the size of the municipality that are informing council and sending them reports and, and feel like they have a seat at the table. The that, that is a great aspect of getting youth involved at this level. I believe the other thing is that the stigma of young people in politics needs to be removed from the older generation. The older generation, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes they, they still think politics is an old boys club. And, and, and really, and if you look at it across the board in Canada, it's really changing whether we have people of color on councils and women and younger people, that needs that whole stigma needs to change. When I was on council, I'd always wear a shirt and tie and and a suit, and I and I would get heckled for that. And so, where like the lines of professionalism within saying, "Hey, you have this, you have a seat at the table too," has to change because if the older people are still going to be putting down the younger people when someone else sees what I did or something like that, if they said, Oh, well, he just got, you know, he just got put down the whole time. No, thank you. Um, but there, like I said, there was great people as well, but there was also always those voices, always the negative that, you know, you're too young, you can't do this. So that, that really needs to change. Um, and, and alongside with the youth councils, it's, it's really changing in that aspect, but not a lot of municipalities have great resources to develop that or, a specific staff person to develop that. So I, I mean, I, I attempted to try one uh, even with four adjoining municipalities when I was on council and it, it just, it couldn't get any traction. So sometimes in the smaller municipalities, it's, it's really tough to kind of find those people that are really interested in it. I'm interested in some of the networking piece that you had talked about. Did you, uh, while you were elected, whether on council or as mayor, did, did you ever reach out to people around your age in similar roles to compare notes or did you ever find that people are around Ontario or around the rest of the country may have reached out to you for collegiality or advice? 
Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, I think, you know, when I first got elected, we were pre-COVID, so I had a chance to go to the AMO conference, uh, I think only one of them uh, during my career. So uh, in that, they have a youth um, council under 35 elected officials uh, gathering of sorts for an evening. So I made great contacts uh, throughout that, and we we kept close uh, th- through whatever, our four years and and beyond. So there's there's definitely a network of people that are under that 35 threshold. And really, they're under 35 is, is quite young in politics. So it, it was great to have that. And yeah, I, reaching out to them and then also having so many people reach out to me and say, wow, like this is awesome. Didn't know we can do this. And and really trying to motivate some people to, to throw their name in. It's, it, you know, like I said at, at the start of the interview, it's go down to city hall and you write your name and there you go. Right. So it's, it's definitely a daunting task when you first look at it, but some of the smaller municipalities can really benefit from a young person. Yeah. I thank you for that. Um, I want to turn to the youth coalition account, youth council coalition of Canada. I want to make sure I get the name correct here. Um, Can you explain to Ian, myself, to our viewers, what is this organization? Because when I was doing a deep dive, uh, I know one of the people, Kelsey Santa Rosa, who's been on our show as well, uh, is a great counselor for the municipality of Lakeshore. But what does this organization do and how does it advocate for more youth involvement in politics? Yeah, so uh, Kelsey had started the whole thing with two of her friends down in uh, Windsor area. And I had joined on the board of directors uh, couple years later and yeah we're, we're just very small uh board of directors just trying to locate uh youth councils and and just contact them and and know that let them know that we're there for more resources and help a lot of the time when these youth councils start up um they don't have a sense of like something as simple as making a delegation a council or having agenda and minutes for their meetings and stuff like that. So it's, it's really just a resource based uh, support group that we're trying to, to gain membership across Ontario to start and and possibly Canada, if it could ever grow that big, but really it's just about supporting youth councils because when they, like I said, when they, when they start, some of them have, no idea in what direction to go and and who to market to and all that kind of stuff. So it's really, uh, really garnered around that. So you did leave, obviously you didn't, you chose not to run in the the last municipal election in Ontario. Why was that? Well, I was uh, in Thunder Bay for the last year of my, uh, my, mayoral ship and uh yeah it it just became a lot i knew that the next two years of law school were going to be busy and uh the travel from thunder bay to naren center was a little more difficult than ottawa to naren center and just uh being being in the community as much as i wanted to be wasn't a realistic aspect um and and just life got in the way i guess so yeah, that that was my main reason. I would have loved to continue if uh, geography and education uh, weren't a factor, but that's ultimately what ended up happening. All right. So you we took the boy out of politics. I suspect we didn't take politics out of the boy. What's next? The man, the man, Ian, the man. Yeah, yeah, he's now man. The staying. <laughs> um. What's next? Well, I uh, write my Ontario bar in June, so I will be a called Ontario lawyer, hopefully by the fall of 2024. And uh, yeah, I just I want to uh, develop myself professionally for the next uh, little bit, um, but eventually get involved at, at the federal or the provincial level or, or even municipal. I'm, I'm not shy uh, from that. So mm-hmm. at some point, uh, I will hope to put my name in the ring uh, down the road. Don't know where, when, how that's going to happen, but uh, definitely in the back of my mind. And it, and I think politics, I some days I read the news and I open the news and I go, oh boy, that is not for me. And then some days I would read and open the news and go, oh yes, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. So it really, uh, it's really going to depend on uh, life scenarios in a couple of years and where I'm at and who I am at that point. So uh, but definitely down the road, I 
do want to get involved at more of a higher level, but uh, to be determined. What advice would you give to the next generation? Now, you are a unicorn in essence, because you are someone who, and I've used that line a few times, that's why Ian just chuckled there a little bit, but you are a unicorn in some sense, because you get elected at a young age, you become deputy mayor, the one one of the youngest, if not the youngest in all of Canada, you then become a mayor of your community, and that is a, no small feat in itself. Your path in municipal politics and politics is unique, and you are the only person who can say that they've done that what advice would you give to that next generation that person that young boy young girl who comes up and says frederick can we sit down and have a conversation about your time because i want to be the next frederick for my community yeah i think there's two things get informed and get involved early so what i mean by get informed um read the news read uh read parties bylaw books or, or policy books, I mean, as nerdy as that sounds, really knowing what each party stands for and how that adds to your values as a person, as a professional, and and maybe as a politician is really important. And obviously, the municipal world doesn't have party lines, but sometimes the party lines creep in when you're sitting on council and you, you can kind of read the room on who stands where. But if you're informed, then you can get involved. If you know what the issues are and if you know who stands for what, that kind of sort of thing, then you can get involved. And if you really are really enjoying a certain party's position, reach out, reach out to those people. Most of them, like I said, have a youth wing or have an MP that's really good with young people or have somebody that's within the party that really wants to harbor and foster this kind of young talent. It can take you places and it can make you lots of connections and it can, it can really expand your mind and open your world into that area. But first and foremost, you have to get informed and you have, you know, know who the players are, know what the issues are, and then you can get involved. And, and that's really what I did at the end of the day. And I, and I, and yeah, I got involved at a very small level. Um, but it, it opened my world to so many different possibilities and so many different ideas that I can't stress enough how important those four years were in my life in terms of development, really. Frederick, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from Ian for sitting down, taking time out of your business schedule to do this. That was probably the best way to end an interview that I could imagine. And we appreciate you doing this interview. I can imagine talking municipal politics with two people from Alberta on a Canada wide show is probably not what you had in mind for a Monday afternoon, but we appreciate you taking time to do this. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Fred. Our full interview with Frederick will air next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Ian, why is for youth? We are now one episode away from finishing the uh, municipal alphabet. How do you think today's episode went? I was thinking back there. What the heck was I doing when I was 19, 20, 21? And I was not, I'm pretty sure I wasn't the mayor of my community by that point. It's kind of neat to see somebody with this kind of a focus and drive and passion. He mentioned it was a bit of a family thing to him too. So having that kind of support from the people who are important to you was kind of cool. So I was kind of invigorated by everything that he had to say. It was, it was a fun little interview. So we are about two weeks away from our last episode of 26 episodes of finishing the entire municipal alphabet. Uh, looking back on the first 25 letters, how... Uh, I, I can't believe we're here, to be honest. It's kind of eye-opening that we have done 26 great interviews with great leaders, talked about great municipal stories. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what Zed brings us, or Z, or however you want to pronounce it, wherever you're listening to this. Um, but after this, we're still continuing on the show, right, Ian? Yeah, well, first of all, Z is for Zoom, as these <laughs> things Zoom passed over the last year, or year and a half or so. And uh, you like that? And uh, it would be fun to, to wrap this up and then we'll think about, well, we've already started to think about kind of what do we do next. I, I, it's been interesting to watch the viewer numbers as well and see how we've been resonating with people who have been listening or watching some of the comments we've got back about some of the things we've talked about, ideas for concepts and ideas for people to talk to. That's been really cool as well because 
right now we're just broadcasting, but hearing back from people, I think I get the idea we're actually engaging. And I really like that. And reach out to us. If you're on LinkedIn, if you're on uh, Instagram, if you're on Facebook, reach out to, or on X, uh, as we just told you in the show, don't go on social media, reach out to us. Let us know. Is there thing, something that you want us to talk about? Is there a story that you're listening to or reading in your community that you would want us to talk about on the show? We want to hear from you directly. So our, our, Direct messages are always open. Our emails are always open. We always want to hear from our amazing listeners and viewers from across this great nation and around the world. Uh, until next time, until Zed, Z, or Zoom, however you want to call it, Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you. Nice to see you again, Chris. Talk to you.